afraid. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pat Jeswaldo. The Metal Hall of Fame is a nonprofit organization that enshrines forever those legendary musicians, artists, and music industry executives who are responsible for making hard rock and heavy metal music what it is today. Their contribution to the genre is invaluable, and they keep inspiring all of us fans throughout the world, from generation to generation. Every January, we hold the annual Metal Hall of Fame induction gala. And it is here where rock stars, iconic music industry executives, and music fans throughout the world join together to create an event that has earned the reputation as the most important night in hard rock and heavy metal. It is here where new friendships are forged and established relationships throughout the decades develop an even stronger bond. There is a strict nominating criteria for induction into the Metal Hall of Fame. And one is the Metal Hall of Fame takes into account all of the fans who vote on our website for all their favorite hard rock and heavy metal artists. And two is our nominating committee and executive board, which is comprised of legendary musicians and music industry executives who make sure the voting process is fair and accurate. As a result, only hard rock and heavy metal bands and artists will be inducted into our Hall of Fame. Of course, we can never forget our nonprofit organization, DAT, Drugs and Disabilities. Doctors, psychologists, special needs therapists, and teachers in over 15 countries use my pioneering healing art of drum therapy techniques to help special needs children and adults and wounded veterans develop retention, coordination, and fine motor skills. That program trains and certifies all of these individuals to help them help others. So on behalf of the Metal Hall of Fame Board of Directors and the entire executive team, I thank you all for helping us help others and joining us in this great metal cause. Seriously. I was going to say, I'm not going to say it. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Mutual friend. <laughs> um, hello. Say hello to Keith Roth, my good friend here. Uh, so, we are here at the Metal Hall of Fame. Thank you for coming. Thanks to those watching on the stream. And I, uh, this is something Pat Jesualdo, who you'll soon meet if you haven't already, who runs this. Uh, got me tied into this in year one. It's something I always enjoy doing. It usually happens the day before NAM starts in Anaheim, California, and it's usually very, very different than the way it's happening right now because obviously it's happening right now this way because of uh, NAM not happening and stuff not happening in California. So Pat got resourceful and figured out a way to do it still, incorporating the stream and some video and some people that are local here in New Jersey. Pat, myself, Keith, we're all Jersey natives, so it worked out that we ended up here. And uh, we're looking forward to doing it and looking forward to uh, having this event. Uh, we got some, we do have some great guests here on the premises, and then the bulk of the presentation and the awards is going to happen as a produced program that's going to air starting right around 2 o'clock, and that is when everything will roll out. Uh, everybody watching, that's when you'll see the whole awards and all that. But we're going to talk to some people here on site, right, Keith? Absolutely. We got uh, Jerry Gaskell's joining us, right? Yeah, we got Jim. So, yeah, JJ so, from Twisted Well, Twisted we should Twisted. probably, should we, should we reveal? I, everybody knows him, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, don't know. I would hope so. I don't know what's secret and what's not. I get it every moment on my Facebook page, so it's. Oh, like, okay. Because there, there is a secret here today. Which, oh, yeah, I know. That's what I've heard. We, we just found out about it a few minutes yes. ago. Yes. But, so I, that's what I'm saying, I don't know what is and isn't secret, so. Um, but go ahead, run down the list, go ahead. Okay, so we got Eddie and Keith at 12 to 12, 15. That's 15, us, 15, we're doing that now. That's right. <laughs> oh, we got Munzee, I was only kidding by the way. We got JJ French from Twisted Sister. We got Mark Weiss who basically captured the 80s and his book, The Decade That Rocked. Jerry Gaskill from King's X, Ross the Boss from The Dictators in Manowar. Andy Shirnoff and Albert Bouchard, Andy from The Dictators, Albert from Blue Oyster Cult and then yeah, uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. And the uh, Dictators are going to perform Unplugged and announcing their new singer. Yeah, there's a surprise coming. There's a big announcement surprise as far as that's concerned. It's going to be huge. Yeah, it's going to be massive. And uh, going to be needed extra security when that gets Yeah, announced. that's going to be, people are going to be rushing the doors. <laughs> big time. All right, so, <laughs> so let's, um, Let's get it going, because we're, so what we're going to do here at the start is we're just going to run through briefly uh, saying hello to a few people and bring them out to sit with us, and then that will lead into 
a perform the performance obviously you're speaking the performance is public right everyone knows there's a performance yeah I believe uh, so. I don't know what's sort of, <laughs> <laughs> like a bad comedy duo. <laughs> We're emulating Cheech and Chong. Exactly. Literally. We just don't have weed. Um, all right, so, th so there's a performance. Liar. <laughs> uh, the last time you and I did something like this together, we co-hosted Guns N' Roses at the Apollo, right? It was right? nine hours long. It was nine hours long, yeah. It was a great show. I can't go nine hours. The Giants start at four, so. That's uh, 425. Yeah, the I, trust me, I know. I'm an, already started I'm an hour it. from here. I know where I, I got my timing down. So okay, so um, is Didi coming? I heard. Didi I heard. Is Didi well, here? So Didi's a bigger Giants fan than me. Not bigger, but equal to. Didi may be like getting suited up at this point. Like I don't know. So He's we'll got say. the shoulder pads on. Exactly. See, I wish Snake was here because at least you know we're both balance. Yeah, yeah, balance. Some balance, balance. Yeah. yeah. All right. So anyway, so yes, the dictators are going to perform, and then Pat who uh, runs the, the Metal Hall of Fame, great guy, and there is a charitable component to this as well. Pat will be out here, and he'll say a few words, and then that will lead into the debut of the stream, which are the actual awards this year, which was all done and pre-recorded. Again, that's not normally how this works, but because of COVID and everybody being separated, that's the way they did it this year. So there you go. Okay, let's get him out here right now. A guy that I say this lovingly is a pain in the ass to me for about 40 years now because that's how long I've been in radio and that's how long he's been breaking my ass to play records and probably a pain in your ass too, right? We say it lovingly. Oh, Munzee? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you knew what I was talking about. Dude. <laughs> Dude. Something for you. We love him to death. So Munzee. Like punk rock. Where's Munzee? There he goes. <laughs> take, a, take a seat in here. As soon as I walked in, Muncie's like, so brother, I got the new one coming from you. Yeah. Ever the pitch man, ever the pitch man. KK Downey's new record's coming out, right? Yeah, so I'll take, so Munch, you were actually, because I've done every one of these events in, uh, in when we've done them in, in Anaheim, you, what was it, the last one that you were actually inducted in? Yeah, two, yeah, two years ago, uh, Pat had called me and said that, uh, you know, I'm looking at, uh, you know, the face of heavy metal and the promotion world, and we haven't seen many people that have, like, stayed in one genre and kept doing the same thing for more than 30 years, really outside of concrete foundations, which most people know, like Bob Schiaparty, you know, he had started in the early 80s, and uh, his company was very well known for promotion and marketing. Uh, when I had left Polygram Records in 91 and I started the company, uh, I didn't know that at that point we were going to start approaching 30 years and Pat had said to me, well, we'd like to induct your company. And I said, I looked at him and I was, I was a little confused and I said, well, why? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm a promo guy. There's, there's like every, every record company and there's a lot of indies and there's a lot of people that do what we do. So why? And he said, just because of what you do. And I thanked him, and we met for breakfast, and uh, I flew to Anaheim, and I was very graced and uh, honored to actually be inducted and have the company brought into the Hall of Fame. And so I want to thank Pat, and uh, obviously every radio station that played every record that we had, including both of you guys, even the ones that were crumbs, too. You must really work with great acts. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, 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 have, we definitely have a lot of big acts. Um, we've had a lot of small acts. You know, but, uh, you know, the company covers a big spectrum of everything, you know, within the genre. Of Iron that. Maiden and Monster Magnet. Yeah, that's right. Maiden, Monster Magnet, Judas Priest, Overkill. And now we have, you know, some of the smaller developing band bands like the Spider Rockets, you know. So we've uh, we've had... And you, you've experienced some of my meltdowns throughout the years, right? Like, you know, I'm going through an emotional whirlwind throughout the day. I, I, I vent to Munzee on the phone. He calls me up to play records, and I'm like... Dude, I had a crazy day, I had to do this, I had to do that. And you sit with me through it, it's like therapy. It's well, therapy. yeah, it's... I appreciate I'm, it. I should give you my insurance card. Well, you know, I mean, I should put doctor in front of my stuff. I listen, dude, whatever it takes, you know? I mean, I learned something from Neil Bogart, you know, when, when I was, like, first coming up. And, uh, you know, I, I got called into the office from David Leach, and he was the senior vice president of the promotion at Polygram Records, and he said, okay, this is how it's done. And, uh, you learned from the best. Yeah, I learned from him, and uh, you know, I learned from Brenda Romano, who's actually the CEO at Interscope now, and 
Joe Riccatelli, who was the uh, GM at RCA now, uh, recently. You grew up, you, you know, you yeah. came up through that glory yeah. period. Yeah. Know, yeah, yeah. When records really meant everything to everybody. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, Eddie, you relate to that because I, I love talking to you. We could be at an airport. And uh, we see each other, and next thing we're both missing our flights talking about the new UFO record. Yeah. As the case may be. Yeah. We grew up in that special time, but one of the funniest stories you ever told me is a good friend of ours, Steve Conti, Company of Wolves, the oh, band yeah. that was signed a Polygram, and they sold, what, like 60,000 copies? And there was like a meltdown meeting over it? Like, yeah. imagine a band selling 60,000 records in this time. Today, they'll get you number one for a month. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a year, right? Yeah, I, I mean, Company of Wolves is great. Like, Jim Lewis found the band, and, and if you really listen to the record, they were great, a great record. band. And the record was great, but like sometimes some things don't sell, or they, they just don't work. And there's, there's not a science to how you make something happen. It just, either it's going to happen or it's not, and then you have to guide it along. That's why, you know, a lot of times when it comes to radio, you know, I'm calling you for, you know, for the ballroom and Eddie for uh, Sirius XM. You know, I, I mean, it's so important for us to transcend that message and have, like, your, your listener base and the whole market cue have the potential to hear something because we don't know if it's going to happen or not. We have to try to make that happen. But the thing is about both you guys that I love very much is because you're both real and uh, sincere and honest. And that's why you guys have been working for all these decades. And, you know, it's honesty. And it's a bond that just happens with time. And uh, I have nothing but love and respect for both of you. And, uh, People should know that. If I can validate that, I'll triple it. You know. That's good. I'm, I'm paying for alcohol later. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> I had to sneak in like two or three white claws. But, uh, Keith brought a cooler. He thought he was going to a Jets tailgate. <laughs> well, Mutz, uh, congrats. 30 years on yeah. skateboard marketing. That Mutz. He's a real deal. He's got nothing but love and passion for you. Yeah, I, I knew months when we were both working for labels in the mid 80s and I was still doing radio then and then he started this thing called skateboard marketing and I was like, what the heck's that? And here he is 30 years later promoting and pestering people who play records and that's his job. That's what he's supposed to do. And I, you know, I, I what you guys were saying, I mean, look, when Keith and I get yapping, it's ours. And we don't need an audience, just the two of us. But the thing is, is like you could agree with this. I mean, some of our favorite bands, some of our favorite records, are bands and records that unfortunately went nowhere. That most nobody of them. knows. Most of them. I mean, the vast majority. I I do a thing on First my album was one of my all time favorite records to this day. Dictators. I mean, I go Girl Crazy. I bought that at Alexander's in 1975, yeah. and you know I saw this maniac on the cover. It looked like a pro wrestler, and it was like it resonated where I grew up in the Bronx and and. It had wrestling, it had punk rock, and one of my all-time favorite records. I mean, to me, it should be the biggest record on the planet, but we've had many of these kind of conversations throughout yeah. the years. Yeah. I think his favorite band is UFO. And I one of them, yeah. Introduced you to John Borneo, who's the only other guy who said his favorite band was UFO. Right. We went down a rabbit hole a few minutes ago in the back, yeah. But, yeah, that, that's just it. I do a thing on my radio show, my daily show, that I call bands that should have been huge, and I people call in and tell me the bands that they love that they felt should have been huge. And it's one of the biggest shows I do. I do it like, you know, once a month or something because everybody has those bands. Like, dude, why wasn't this band huge? And just get, and by doing a show and doing like doing that, it actually helps turn people on to those bands because they're like, wow, New England? I never heard of them. Uh, I saw know, them kiss. See, this is how it happens. happens. You see how it happens? It's already happened. I saw them with kids. Of course, on the Dynasty 20, 79, yeah. yeah. It was great. Uh, Piper, 77. Piper, right? Billy Squire's first band. Amazing. First one was better. See, this is this could get really go really quick the wrong way. Uh, all of a sudden, Pat's like, you know, see, Pat's flashing me the light right now. Cut it. Enough with this shit. All right, no, we got to get it moving because the, uh, the stream of the award starts at 2. Okay, so next up, we are, oh, this is, this is a guy that, uh, well, I didn't even recognize him, and then he, then he told me, well, he can say this when he comes out, how old he's about to be, which is the most mind-blowing thing ever because he looks like he's easily 30 years younger than that, uh, but he's a guy I've got a lot of history with and a lot of friendship, and he had even mentioned yesterday uh, was obviously a, a tragic, tragic anniversary that we all remembered, but uh, he and I are connected through that, which we can talk about here in a second. But we'll bring him out right now as the founding member of Twisted Fucking Sister, guitarist J.J. French in the house.
So JJ, uh, excuse me, I am in the witness protection program. No, it's so convenient. <laughs> well, I said this the other day. Really, really famous people, like super famous actors and stuff, they're going to do the mask thing forever because forever. it's given them freedom to go through airports and. You know, if you're Slash and you put the mask on and your hair up in a baseball hat, you can go anywhere for the first time in your life. Paul McCartney said it's the greatest thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> you know, here's what I think. I like have, I always think like Saturday Night Live jokes. Like you imagine a guy just getting out of jail from like bank robbery from 20 years ago, you know, and he's thinking maybe I should rob a bank and he walks to a bank and says, must wear a mask. <laughs> you know, last time he wore a mask, he was arrested. You know? He walks to the bank and goes, is everybody robbing this bank? <laughs> like, what's going on? So it's a strange life. I just told, we're talking about how you look. It's not, you're not, it's not a secret. You should be proud of this. Tell everybody what birthday you have coming up. Well, not next year, I'll be 70. Oh. This, this guy is 69 years old. I mean, 70 is to be 50. Because... Oh, God. Now, let me say, this is what I say to people. People say to me, you look 50. I said, I may look it, but at 7 a.m., I am 70. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been working with uh, David Johansson for 20-some years. Right. He's 71. He hasn't changed at all, uh, Punky Meadows. I mean, 70 is like nothing, man. No, and Dee's looks just getting going. Dee's looks 70 since he was 20. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, and he has a wonderful sense of humor about it, but when I introduce him on stage, I always say, here's, here's the guy that looks like Sarah Jessica Parker dipped in a vat of acid. You know? and, 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 and the British press said that about him, and that's how I introduce him on stage. He has an amazing, he has an amazing sense of humor. He has to when he reads my book, which is coming out <laughs> We'll talk a little bit about that. I, you've got a lot of projects. You, you're doing a podcast, and I know you had me re on recently, so I thank you. JJ started a podcast not too long ago about uh, interviews, but also a lot. You know, JJ, for those that don't know, worked in management and still manages acts and managed Seven Dust early on and looks after the business of Twisted Sister. So you come at this not only from the perspective of being a guitarist and a performer in a very well-known band, but also you've always been very much connected to what goes on behind the scenes and the business of it. Yeah, and that evolved uh, because um, as a young kid, I was selling Boy Scout cookies uh, for the Boy Scouts. We used to sell cookies like the girls did, we did, and I set the all-time record in my scout troop. And uh, they threw me out the following year for having long hair at the age of 13, and then they had the temerity to call me up and say, would you sell cookies again this year to keep our quota up? And I said, you threw me out last year for having long hair. This is all in the book, I detail this in the book. And they said, yes, but we would like you to sell cookies this year. And my, and my father said to me, you know that guitar that you want, that's $25 that you want that I won't give you? Tell them you want a commission on the cookies, and uh, tell them you want ten cents a box. I'm 13 years old. I said, if you give me ten cents a box, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. So they said, okay. So my father, who was a jewelry salesman on 47th Street, took me down to 47th Street, made every freaking rabbi and you know diamond dealer on the street buy cookies, and I sold 242 boxes. I broke the all-time record at that time. And I made $24.20, and my father threw in the 80 cents because he's the big spender that he is. <laughs> and I got my first guitar. And I will tell you that that Boy Scout cookies then led to firecrackers, which then led to drugs. So heroin is definitely the end product Natural of the Boy Scout. There. <laughs> so I'd be very careful if your kid says he wants to be a Boy Scout, because I can draw a direct line from that to heroin use. Okay? <laughs> I'm just saying, just saying, be careful. It's a dangerous profession, your Boy Scouts. So we don't have a ton of time here, but I do want want you to talk about your book because you as soon as I saw you you said the book is uh, you, the book's done it's coming so tell everybody about it it's called twisted business uh, basically life lessons through the through the prism of, of, of rock and roll and um, yes I, I had all these multiple lives and then the life that led to me ultimately uh, from um, being a drug addict and drug dealer to completely straightening out my life and of course what do you do when you totally straighten out your life you become a transvestite rock musician which is what <laughs> I did I went directly into female impersonation I don't know what made my mother more terrified would you please go back to drugs please? get this chance and, uh, and that led to Twisted Sister which by the way and this is a perfect segue to Mr. Trunk Eddie presides over a generation of bands of a music that has been derided and, and, and consistently screwed by the press and yet is probably probably more responsible for more tickets being sold and more international fame, fortune, and lust and love for metal than any other genre in the history of the world. Because today, if it wasn't for COVID, if it wasn't for COVID bands that have been around for 50 years, and back in 73 when we started, you look who started in 73, 
You had Kiss started in 73, ACDC started in 73, Judas Priest started in 73, Alice Cooper was around already prior to 73, Scorpion 67. Look at these bands, look at their legacies. If you would have asked any one of us back then, if we would have been around uh, in 10 years, we'd say, no, maybe 10, again, the Beatles were 10 years, 60 to 70, that was the longest running band in the world, and yet here we still are, talking about the most viable music, and Eddie Trunk is uh, the mouthpiece for that music and for all these bands. And, so, um, and yes, we're tied together to Matt, and the book Twisted Business is about how we ran the business of Twisted Sister, and why Twisted Sister still matters today, and we have, luckily, the most licensed two of the most licensed songs in the history of rock and roll. So you can hate my band, you can think I suck, whatever, but you can't take away the fact that we're not gonna take in I Wanna Rock on more TV shows, more commercials, more everything than any other music from that genre. And I'm so proud because that can never be taken away. And the story of how that all evolved is in the book Twisted Business, which will be out on the 21st of, uh, of September, and I'll be doing this story for Mike Noble. But we're here to talk about Mark's book, too, let's be fair. Thank well, you, I, mean, I mean, this is the important I just want to say one thing, though, JJ. Yes. You know, being a kid, going to see Twisted Sister, fortunately getting in once to the fountain where Metallic opened for you guys, and then uh, seeing you at Zappies, and then being able to get into Lemoore's. There was no better band. No better band. If the band was playing the Enormo Dome, we would always go see Twisted Sister. The only fear we ever had is getting the spotlight shown on us during It's Only Rock and Roll on the Stones cover, but there's none better. The Wait a minute, I need to figure this out, because Keith and I were just talking backstage about age. So Keith, you, Keith is about a year younger than me, and I couldn't get in to see Twisted Sister in these places. How did you do that, Keith? I would just walk in. I mean, well, I never, I got in once to the fountain for the Metallica show, because oh, yeah. all my friends were going, yeah. and John and all those guys, so I just walked in with the group, and then uh, Zappies, well, I, I kind of lived in Edison, which was right down the road from Piscataway, and it was just a fortunate night, you know, it was bowling and then Twisted Sister afterwards, but the Moors, we never had a problem getting it. Come on, you didn't have no problem getting it. You know what, though, can I just say, back in those days, uh, you know, 15, 18-year-old drinking age, right. which well, meant 15-year-olds with, you know, now, I don't think shop class exists anymore, right? Does shop class exist? Probably not. But back in those days, everybody went to shop class and made fake proof. How easy was it to make fake proof? And you'd show up at these, at these venues, and nobody cared. So the amount of kids available to play to was in the thousands, and the clubs so when you saw us with uh, Metallica, New Year's, Year's John, Johnny Z brought Metallica in to open for us. It was their first show on the East Coast. And there were 5,000 people there because that's what the clubs held, 5,000 people. And people don't understand. You could actually work six days a week. You could be cover band and you're working six days a week. And, and Found Casino is a perfect example. May I tell a brief story, by the way, Eddie, that I think you really appreciate? Amongst and I go into this thing in the book. The band played about 9,000 performances. And I, I have the whole schedule in the book. It's really mind-blowing to look at how many nights we played and how we survived and the fact that I have any hearing at all. My wife will attest that I don't. But amongst the craziest things that ever happened was one night some guy in the four and a half in White Plains was going, hey man, twist the sister, you guys aren't loud enough. And we were so loud. Like, we had Marshall Stacks and the little barks, right? And I said to the guy, oh, yeah, he's, he's heckling me and D. And mostly when these guys heckle me and D, they don't understand that me, D, and Mendoza with our heels were, were six feet, eight inches tall. So they come up on stage and they immediately were going, I'm sorry, man. I really so love your band, you know? But this guy's going, you're not loud enough. And I, and I grabbed him by the hair and I put his head in the Marshall Stack. I said, is that loud enough? He goes, no. I said to the road crew, tape them to the marshals, and they came out, and they taped him like Jesus Christ <laughs> to the marshal staff, like this. And he's got a big smile on his face. He's like on 90 drugs with him. Oh. And we're playing a whole set, and I keep looking, going, this guy's like, and the guy's got the biggest smile in the world. And after like an hour, they take him down. And I'm thinking to myself, man, what, what ever happened to that guy? That was my question, like, what ever happened to the guy that we came like to the Marshall staff? A couple of years ago, I'm walking through Grand Central Station, and some guy kind of recognizes me, you know. I hear, hey, JJ! Yeah. Hey, JJ! Yeah. Hey, man, remember the white plate four and a half? Remember the time you took the guy to the Marshall staff? I go, is that you? He goes, no, that was my best friend, man. I said, how's he doing? He goes, are you kidding? He tells people that was the greatest night of his <laughs> And I said, is he married with children? And he goes, yeah. He goes, that's still the greatest night of his <laughs> Oh my God. 
Uh, thank you, JJ, for coming up here, everybody. Give it up for JJ Ferris. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with the book. We'll definitely look forward to reading it. Thank you for coming. All I know is I stood outside the Chatterbox on Seaside Heights boardwalk trying to get in to see all these bands, and they weren't taking my fake ID up there. And really quick, 20 years ago, 9-11, about a week later, this man called me and he said they don't want to have metal bands raise money for the Widows and Orphans from the New York City Police and Fire Department, but I want to get metal bands and he put it together and that's why we raised a million dollars. Yeah, that was when we launched a Twisted Sister. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I appreciate that, JJ. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was uh, this book too. That's going to be great. Yep, yeah, yeah, that was an event. How great was the uh, Twisted Sister documentary? Great. We are Twisted Fucking Sister. Check that out. JJ talking about those club days, you can see all of that in there. And yeah, it kills me because I couldn't get into these clubs. I was, every time, I swear to God, when the you never went to Playland and no. Times Square? No, all you had to do I was tried. I, I was so drunk when I went up there one night that I kept putting my real date of birth on there. And the guy's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, it's my birthday. And my friends are like, dude, you gotta make yourself older. Remember when Times Square was Times Square though, Show World and all that? That the was, dude, the, it was the best. Oh my God. Yeah, it was the great, that's how we got him to see. Yeah, I couldn't. I, every time the drinking age in this state was 18, I'm like, about to turn 18. They moved it to 19. About to turn 19, they moved it to 20. It was like, I thought they were going to move it to 50 just so I could get that one point. Now I'd kill to be proofed, but... The, the funny, you know Danny and Hello, right? Yeah. Well, you know his buddy Bishop, right? They're like three days apart, but Danny made it by like three days. Oh, I missed He was born like January 3rd. So he sat in a bar for three years before Bishop, and they're three days oh. apart. I, miss, I had friends the same deal. Oh, I missed it every time. Torture. All right, so speaking of Twisted Sister, here's a, we'll bring up a guy now that, uh, well, this, this venue that we're in has been housing his amazing photos. We mentioned his book earlier, The Decade That Rocked, an incredible, incredible book that I wrote the afterword for, for him. I'm sure he got paid well. Uh, <laughs> slice of pizza in the back just now. Uh, but no, it's, uh, it's an amazing book. It really is. And it's obviously great. this guy's an amazing legendary photographer who shot everyone, including the cover of the Stay Hungry album for Twisted Sister. Uh, let's bring him up right now for a few minutes. Mark Weiss joins us. How are we doing this? You want to stay? You want to go with the guest on the end, or yeah, let's do that. This way, Keith and I can share the mic. Keith, I'll let you start this one. Jersey's in the house. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy that basically captured the '80s. I mean, he's been at every event from 1977 till current. You know, Mark Weiss, the legendary album covers, Twisted Sister, Come Out and Play, the debut Skid Row record, Slippery When Wet. You know, your face and uh, all your photos in Circus Magazine and Hit Parader and all that stuff. I mean, this guy. Is almost like a biblical feature, uh, a figure, a biblical figure <laughs> in the world of rock and roll. I like that. I like that. What do you think, so? Yeah. Well, well, like I said, in in if you have Mark's book, and if you don't, you should get it because it is amazing. The it, what I wrote when Mark hit me up to write something in the book was true. So you talk about the '80s. I mean, Mark was shooting shows in the '70s too, and I, I know the book is about the '80s, but I remember going to shows '70s, early '80s as a kid. And really, before I even knew Mark, and we've known each other at least probably 40 years at this point, but I remember seeing, like, like I would be in my seats at the Meadowlands or at the Garden or wherever the show was, and I'd always know that the band was going to start soon because I'd see Mark walk out from the backstage area and go into the photo pit. And I kind of knew him, and I knew, you know, it's like, oh, oh, Mark's getting in place, so that means they're about to start. Because that was like a sign to me that, he was probably in the, I had this, uh, he's probably in the back taking some photos in the dressing room, and now they're about to start. So if you see him getting in a position with his camera in the pit, I'd see him walk out. Like, I'd be up high, I'd see like this little ant walk by, you know, and there's, there's Mark, and then that was like almost a signal to me that the show was about to start. And he was probably the only person that, uh, that, that had that analogy, so, uh, you know. Yeah, I, well, I used to look at it for all the photographers, but I knew you were always the guy that was really in there and taking the photos in the in the dressing rooms or whatever. So it just kind of clicked with me that maybe that was a sign. It was definitely a sign because that's what I did. Like I used to love to get those pictures right before the stage, before they went on stage, and uh, you know, right before they're walking to the stage, it's the Elvis walk, they always call it. So uh, that was it. You're right. You hit the nail on the head, and uh, I was there. I always loved those moments right before. It's awesome. Talk about the place we're in right now, and, and I know you've been doing a lot of things from here, including a gallery for your photos. 
Uh, going well, we're in the Middletown yeah. Art yeah. Center in Lake County, Jersey, and uh, I'm from Middletown. And, uh, uh, you know, we've been uh, uh, raising money to uh, help, uh, you know, get this place back in shape because of COVID. You know, they took some losses. There was some flood damage. So uh, a lot of my photographs I use to uh, uh, raise money to help the place. Uh, so they gave me this place to show my pho my photography and uh, share it with everyone else. So it's a really it's a nice exhibition. It's a great place. They have other things going on here throughout the year. Encourage people to come check it out. Uh, check out this is the last day of the exhibit. So if you're listening, you're nearby. Come on down. It's going to be here until like four or five o'clock today. Uh, but it's just a really nice place and. Uh, it's a great place. I'm always looking for new places to exhibit my work and share my stories and tell my story uh, and meet people and meet the fans. And it's been a long time. My book came out last year, and right when the pandemic hit. And it was really frustrating because I couldn't meet the people that uh, I wanted to sell my book to and show them and talk to them. Uh, so now I'm going to go out on the road and, and be a one-man show and go out there and meet people and sign books. and tell my stories. Well, let me, I know we got to move this because I know, again, we have more people to talk to. We need to get that stream going. But I do want to ask you, Mark, for you, having done this 40, 50 years, whatever it's been since you were shooting. I know you started as a kid. But what's the biggest difference as a photographer now trying to shoot in the world of music than when you first started? What are some of the biggest changes? Obviously, technology has changed. You can shoot digitally and edit and all that. But I'm just talking about in terms of working with bands. Is it easier? Is it harder? What do you think the biggest differences are? Well, there's really no pressure now because nobody really wants photographs. Uh, you know, there's no magazines like there used to be in the old days. In the old days, you know, a band would do a video shoot. I would be there to photograph it, sell it to the magazines, sell it to the record companies, do the tour books. You know, now, in the beginning of the tour, you know, like uh, Kiss's last tour, they went to New Orleans and I shot about a week's worth of shoot, uh, you know, shows, and they used them, and that's really all they need. Back in the day, when the magazines were happening, every two, three weeks, I would go out with Rad or Ozzy and Scorpions, Aerosmith, whoever it was, and uh, it would be so much work out there, because the magazines, they were like poster child, you know, like I would sell the pictures to the magazines. There's really nothing out there now. Now people, uh, they posted social. So I love shooting, I still did. Uh, I'm gonna continue doing it. And it's more for, uh, to promote the book, really, you know. And Do you hate iPhones? Uh, <laughs> what I mean by that is because everybody in the world is taking their own pictures. Well, I'm in the front of them, but you know, it yeah. does seem a little silly when, you know. But they take good pictures, you know. I, I don't bring my camera sometimes because I, I'll just take that. I got my iPhone. Yeah, half the time with Mark, he starts taking pictures, he takes out his phone. I'm like, you're Mark Weiss, you're not supposed to take a picture of the phone. <laughs> you want that long thing. Yeah, you want to see the guy with the giant camera like that feels like it's the real photographer. Remember Mark used to have his own room case, white sky on it? I still have it actually, I'm on my third one, third generation. And also Mark responsible for uh, getting Zach Wilde in, uh, in Ozzy Osbourne's band and the days of Close Encounters. And yeah, you were there. You I were was there. there, I lived yeah. it. I was underage, right? Hey, all I did was introduce him. I said, Ozzy meet Zach, you know, and that was it. Ozzy meet Jeff. Uh, Jeff, yeah. yeah. Exactly. He's going to run out and beat us up now. No, he says it in his own book. No, I know. But yeah, that, that first... Saturday night. nights, right? Every Saturday night with uh, Cyrus. Cyrus. Cyrus yeah. Saturday yeah. nights. And, but you knew he was going to be... We are so Jersey right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the other Jersey band that uh, had something, a little something to do with. I remember that. You bought him a house and stuff like that. I was envious. Like, Mark Weiss bought that band a house. we got to get fucking better, man. Yeah. we got to get Mark Weiss to buy us a house so we can party. Wait, and... Did you buy a house? Wait, well, you rented a house for a band. Yeah, it was just a band. You see, I'm bringing up stuff to you. Lentz, it was a band called Lentz. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got him. You got him a house? Well, we rented a house. See how I exaggerate? We, we rented a house. We rented a house. It was the part My wife will tell you that. And anytime I went over, they would like clean it up. I'm like, don't clean it up. I want to be part of it. But you know, they were, we were paying the bills. You bought a clubhouse, is what you did. You, you had your own that's it, thought that's about it. it. That's it. But the thing I love about Mark, though, is you'll see him at Giant Stadium shooting Guns N' Roses, and you'll let, next time you see him at the Brighton Bar, right in the front. You know, you, you never lost that passion. I love shooting. That's what I, I, I will what say. I would do, yeah. uh, through this COVID lockdown, I mean, we did a few events for you, and it's almost been yeah. sad. It kept yeah. my sanity. For doing your uh, your Halloween party and yes, your event at yes, Brookdale, yes. and you know Mark is in it for the right reasons, like and, we were talking before. And, and Keith, I just want to say something. Keith, uh, you know, I've been shooting him in this band called Bad Biscuit back in the day. We did a oh, video. Yeah. 
And you remember me. Yeah. It's just great yeah. seeing Keith, I mean, on the air, turn on the radio, he's there on it, Eddie too, it's just great, you know. And he told me about the dictators and they wanted to do a photo shoot with me. And I said, sure, I'll do it. That's a favor to Keith if you're, if you're friends with him. And uh, so I went down there a few weeks ago, I did a photo shoot, they were doing a video. And they said they had the new singer. Um, and uh, so it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, this, this guy is, is, is amazing. He's a really good guy. I think you're gonna like him actually, a lot. <laughs> I know who he is, so. Keith, Keith was kind of talking shit about him a little bit, if I'm being honest backstage. There might be a fight, actually. Could be. It's a big you know, Like I said, my first uh, record that I bought with my own money was uh, Go Girl Crazy, 1975. I used to scratch my brother's records because he was fanatic, you know, like it had to be perfect. So I put a little scratch in there, Stones 12, uh, you want this? But the first amount of uh, money that I bought, uh, the first record I bought my own money in Alexander's was the Dictator's Go Go Crazy. I love that album. One of my all time favorites. So to see them here with us tonight and uh, Ross and Andy, it's going to be great. And seeing who the new singer is. All right, we're getting, we're getting the light. It means to move it along. Mark Weiss, everybody, give it up. Mark, Thank you very much. Mark will be going into the Metal Hall of Fame during the uh, induction portion of the video. Okay, right? Yeah, all right, so get ready, you'll see that in a little bit. So thank you, Mark. Check out his gallery, check out his photos, check out his book. And uh, maybe has captured our music, that's for sure. All right, next up, is he here? I haven't seen this guy. Is Jerry here? Do we have him? Jerry Daskill at King's X, who is a Jersey transplant. Was born, but then left and now has been here for a while again, but it's good to see Jerry as soon as he gets over here. Yeah, I think we can just hold the mics. That's cool. Thank you. What's up, Jerry? Jerry Gaskill from the... <laughs> good to see you, Jerry. Give it up for Jerry from King's X, everyone. So it's funny because we talk about the Jersey, Texas thing with King's X. And for people that don't know this, so King's X originally signed to Megaforce Records in like 87, I think, uh, where I worked at that time. And our office was in Old Bridge and then moved to East Brunswick. And I remember like yesterday, the uh, VHS tape coming into the office. Yeah. And it was, it was a vi like no bands were sending out demos at that time, videos. It was always, you know, cassette. But this is actually a video, and Johnny Z walks it in to the office. He goes, I want you to watch this. I'm like, what is it? So this is a band they just sent me from, from Texas called uh, King's X. And I was like, you go, I want to see what you think. So we sat and watched it. I remember you guys were playing like on a construction site or yeah, something. Yeah. And, uh, and then it was like a month later, we flew these guys from Houston to Old Bridge. We had a barbecue in Johnny's backyard. Yeah. And the next thing you know, King's X are signed, and here they are still kicking ass. Yeah. All these decades later, man. It's amazing. I want to ask you how you are physically, man, because you've been through a lot. How, how's your health? How you doing? I think I'm doing great, man. Good. Good. I think, uh... I'm having a heart attack, all that. We all know that. And, uh, I think it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Heart attacks? The first heart, yeah. I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Helped me to realize that I need to listen to my body. And, uh, it just taught me that, you know, life is, is what it is. I mean, it's ours to, to take for the best we can. And before this happened, I don't think I thought so much of that. I think I knew it in my head. But now the reality is, if I want to be here, I have to take care of my body. That's the only thing that keeps us here. So in a sense, I think that's the best thing that's ever happened to me. But you were always, like, you've always looked the same to me. Like, were, you never struck me as a guy that was abusive to their body. Am I missing something, or? Well, no. Are you I, behind I the actually, scenes, like, going crazy, like? Well, I don't know if I'm behind the scenes going crazy. I think I'm just going crazy. <laughs> There's anyway. no no-show. <laughs> but uh, actually, right before the heart attack, the first one, I was running all over the place. I lived in Highlands. See, damn that exercise. Let that be a lesson you can. That exercise. exercise is overrated. Yeah. Look at me. You don't need to do it. <laughs> well, so I remember that. The bridges up the hills. Oh, I'm doing great. And then I had the heart attack, and I died. I basically died. I went home after being out one night. I just walked home and died. I have no recollection of that whatsoever. But my wife over there will never forget it. 
So to me, it was the best thing that ever happened. To her, it's probably the worst thing that ever happened. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it was so sad. I mean, when we heard about it, because we didn't know, you know, what was going on with you, and then you, and I saw you a few times after that, and you got yourself back in fighting shape, and then it happened again. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, wow, you know. Yeah. Well, here's what my doctor tells me. My doctor, my cardiologist says. Who's your cardiologist? Uh, Doctor Balajos. Okay. Yeah, I love him. Just. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You get old. <laughs> Cholesterol medication, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, are, these are the questions. Like, this is, let this, this is the God's honest truth. Like, I'll walk out from backstage in a show and I'll see some fans and they'll be like, hey man, what were you guys back there? What were you back there talking to Slash about? Well, when we got our last colonoscopy, <laughs> how our cholesterol numbers are, what are, you know, when the So that's really what's going on, isn't it? And speaking of Dr. Wiles, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to tell a story. Okay, please. About uh, a song on my second solo record. Which is an amazing record. Thank you. You had the legendary Earl Slick play yeah, on I that did record. I have the legendary Earl Slick, among others. Bill yes. Sheehan and... Yeah. The great yeah. records are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's called Love and Scars. Go get it. So anyway. Bell Bell. Uh, yeah. But anyway, Dr. Malavos, he's Greek. And... Um, my, one of my, my youngest son, when he was about 10, I think, he came home from school and said, Hey, Dad, I got this line for a song. It's a hypothetical, a medical man who speaks Greek. I'm going, oh, that's cool. I'm going to incorporate that into a song. So I did. And then come to find out, later on, many years, I had the heart attack. I have a Greek doctor, and sometimes he spoke to me in Greek. Wow. <laughs> Talk about clairvoyance, yeah. right? Yeah. So there you go. So what was the original question? Well, I, well, the one question I really want to know, I think most people would want to know too, is I know that King's X finished a record a while ago. Where is the King's X record and what's the status it's of right it? Under, under here. It's, uh, it's basically finished, yeah. It's mastered. We're doing the uh, final packaging things and all that it goes into getting a record out. First one but, uh, over a decade, right? Over a decade, yeah. I think the last one was 2008. And we're all very excited about it. I think we uh, all came together on the same page. We believed in the music. And we all gave everything we had. And we're all very happy with the record. And I can't wait for the world to hear it. And when is that going to be? Uh, when it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Gaskell, everybody. Give it up for Jerry. Thank you. Check out his solo records and maybe there will be a King's X record at some point when it comes out. That's when Keith and I will play it, uh, Jerry, when it comes That's out. That's right. <laughs> we'll come down. We'll be in, on the Jersey Shore. Or maybe we'll be Zooming. Who knows what's going to happen then? Uh, let's hope there's no more Zooming. All right, we'll be more about positive. Yeah, let's hope. Uh, let's not get the Zooming on the screen. Let's get the real, real stuff. All right, so who's up next, Keith, on our hit list? We got... Uh, oh, Ross the Boss. Ross the Boss. Ross the Legendary Boss. Legendary Ross the Boss from Man of War and the Dictators. Here he comes, ladies and gentlemen. What's up, everybody? How you doing? See you, Ross. Hey, thanks for coming here. So I first got to really know Ross. Of course, I know the Man of War stuff. Who doesn't? But uh, I'm going to bring up a band from your past. You probably know where I'm going. Oh, yeah. Ross had a band that I liked a lot. Talk about bands I thought should have been huge. I really was into this band. A band called the Spinatras. Oh, Do you yeah. remember them, Keith? They're like a cheap trick kind of. Yeah, it was great cheap, trick, cheap trick meets the Ramones. Yeah. And uh, I really put a lot of work into that record. And you actually got us up there and like you like really supporting it. And then the record company just uh, what label was that? C something. CMC, CMC. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. and then the next, like, when, when it came out, listen to this look. When the, the week it came out, they decided, the, the ownership changed, and they decided to get rid of everything that wasn't heavy metal. So, you're getting rid of me? How is that possible? I mean, you know, they didn't know the King of, King of Metal was on their label. It was the early days of being canceled, right? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so that was, the, that was it for the Spinachos. But... We go on and on now, so. So what do you guys do? Well, I mean, I know you've been, besides, besides uh, the Dictators and, and Man of War, I mean, you've been making some of your own solo well, yeah, records. Ross, Ross the Boss yeah, Ross the Boss Band, doing well. So I'm, I'm up to my fourth, uh, fourth record on AFM. 
And uh, the other metal band, Death Dealer, uh, we have three albums and two in the can because we have plenty of time to record them. And uh, the, my new, the new thing is the new revamped Dictators. Yeah. Which is... Uh, yeah. 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 And that's right. And uh, we're in the house and uh, we're going to do a little bit and a little bit acoustically and uh, acoustically orientated music. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, kicking some ass. And uh, What do you think about the Dictators, though? A band that, you know, was before the Ramones. Yeah, it was uh, really kind of, of one, arguably could, could be called the first punk rock band. Yeah, one year before the Ramones, uh, very very similar, a lot of similarities to both bands. You know, both New York red bands. They're from Queens. We're from the Bronx, and he's from Malba, Queens. We'll, we'll we'll forget that though. And uh, <laughs> well, um, both bands are, you know, just love each other and uh, wound up being the best of friends and you know. The dictators were there right in the beginning. And uh, Ross is a guitar god. I mean, one of the greatest guitar players in my book. I, I, I've said it for years. I was like, yeah, Jimmy Page, Keith Richards, Ross the Boss. Don't put me in that. Come yeah. on, you know you're that good. Yeah. yeah. And, some, and some crossover, speaking of the dictators, with JJ being here, some crossover because Mendoza was in, right? Was he? He wasn't in originally, was he? No, no, no. Later, right? Mark Moore joined the band for the second record, Manifest Destiny. And, uh, then he went on to Twisted Sisters, so it's it's a it's a family. Were you guys uh, on the was twi was Dictators and Twisted Sister kind of like on the circuit at the same time? Yeah, but we didn't play that? the same clubs. That, you know, we weren't we weren't working as hard as that those guys did. They were they were a machine. They were an absolute machine. But we were signed, you know, so we were on we, on tour with uh, Blue Oyster Cult and uh, Kiss. Kiss. ZZ Top, you know, Foreigner. We were doing all those giant places, and I, on my opinion, we had no business being there, but. <laughs> ACDC? ACDC opened up for the Dictators at the Palladium. Right, they write about it in the block. They, they, they opened up for us with the Michael Stanley band we headlined, right? And they packed their gear up, and they went off the, off the CBGBs, and they played the second show that night. And they blew CBGB's out. I couldn't believe it. And I said, I told my boys, watch this band. Could you imagine Bon Scott and ACDC playing CBGB's they, too? They did it. Sad. It was amazing. And then, then the next week, we opened up for them at the Cleveland Agora. And, we ne and they never opened up for us again. <laughs> never. It's so great what they did. It's amazing. We were talking about that with Mark, like when uh, Keith was saying how Mark always shoots these bands no matter what. Like one day you'll shoot a stadium act and then some, some band in a club. That's how, like if you have Mark's book, that's how in Mark's book he has a picture of John Bon Jovi at 16 because he would go and shoot at that time an unknown guy because you never know what's going to happen and to, to, to be able to do that. I have a ticket stub I came across the other day. The, the Rods... Vandenberg, and the third and the opening act on that bill was Metallica. Yeah. Staten Island. And, and, and so, so stuff like you just never know. Paramount. Paramount, Par Paramount, Paramount. yeah. I have to stop. I was there. It's crazy. So you never know. Like, you know, you see the billing order of bands, and we get those calls all the time. Why is that band opening for that band? It should be the other way around. You never know how it's going to play out in the end. You get a lot of love and a lot of hate. I love them all, though. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we have you have two more members of yeah. your band coming up, right? So we should get them out here. Bring them out, man. And then this way you can introduce the singer and get ready to play. Yeah. Because I'm hearing a lot about this singer, and I really yeah, I'm on the fence player. about his about it, but I really need to see it for myself this to is see if it's going to be good. Andy Sherman from the Dictators, everybody. Andy. And this fellow right here is Albert Bouchard. He's the original member of the Lords of Cult. You know, the greatest cowbell player in the world. This guy right here. <laughs> you hear that song every single day about 50 times. I never get tired of it, though. I can only imagine what you your sound bro. exchange checks are like. I just want everybody to know my cholesterol is really, really good. <laughs> what is it? Yeah. Care to share? Uh, about 170, but I'm on Crestor. Yeah. <laughs> there is no cholesterol festival in the dictators. <laughs> this is a real deal. I mean, I'm not even kidding you. You know, you, you go to... Hanging out with bands is what we're talking about. High blood pressure medication, yeah. prostates, uh, freaking cholesterol. <laughs> back in the 80s, oh, when me. back in the 80s, we got an eight ball, you got some weed, you know, we do some shots. Well, I'm back to the high blood now, pressure medication. Now, 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 it's, now it's cholesterol medicine and blood thinners. <laughs> Getting into my 30s, I'm starting to experience that. You know? <laughs> 
So, so what's in the works with this this band? Uh, Keith and I are interested. Keith has really been asking what's going on with this band. He was talking to me a bit backstage. He's like, uh, yeah, how much he loves the Dictators. I so, so that, Keith, Keith, Keith was asking you know, about. I know. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've been acquaintances for a long time, so uh, appreciate. You know, we had um, we had some business dealings that had to be resolved, resolving another member of the band. Once that was resolved, Ross goes to me and Scott. He says. Uh, why don't we reform the band? And it was like the last thing I ever would have thought of doing. Uh, but Scott was enthusiastic, and I said, well, I'll give it a shot. This is back in November of 2019. So I said, I'll give it a shot. You know, um, if I don't like it, I'll just, I'll just quit and we'll do it. So I said, let's get, let's get Albert. Albert is like not only my favorite drummer, but one of my favorite people on the planet. Yeah. And of course, January, I said, wait, let's do it after the holiday. We'll start talking about it. January 2020, February 2020, pandemic all over the place. And it was actually a blessing that I had something to keep us, all of us, to keep us busy while there's a pandemic on now. Because we've been recording training files back and forth and doing videos. We had two songs out. We got a third one coming out really soon, recording the fourth one. We're just having a good time, you know, making music because every day you make music is a good day, right? Yeah. Musicians, am I right? Okay. You're going to reveal, now you're going to play here in a couple minutes, right on the stage behind this curtain, and you're going to reveal your new singer for the first time. Should, I, what, should we introduce the singer now or well, later? Well, I, I, I was told that, I, I guess, uh, I don't know, when, when is the, let me look at my notes. When are you supposed to do that? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, well, let, yeah, let's, gonna, we should ask you, I wanna let's ask you I'm, about your newest member. Okay, I want to introduce the singer right now. Keith, this is Albert. Albert, Keith, Keith, this is Ross. Introducing the, Keith Ross. Keith Ross! Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's great, he's great. You know, I've been a fan of this band for a long time. I've had uh, friendships with Ross and Andy and Albert. You know, Albert, it was actually Albert's idea, right? He's like, uh, I thought it was your idea to yeah. come down and, yeah. well, people that were at Soundcheck saw us yeah. playing, so I, they, they kind of figured I went it out. For a jog and, uh, and I said, that's it, that's the guy. Because we were talking about who can we get to, because Scott, for, you know, for. Yeah. Uh, Scott, our only member, had, had some health issues and he couldn't continue. Yeah, so we we realized that we didn't want to be a trio. We had to get another guy. And so I'm, I'm out running, and I'm like, that's it, it's Keith Roth. So, yeah. Yeah, I love these guys. I mean, uh, we get along great, and I love the music, and I, people, I can't wait for people to hear what's coming. Wait until you see his rider demands when you do a show. <laughs> you guys may be seeing the only performance of Keith Roth with the dictators here in the Metal Hall of Fame. This guy, no brown in the M&Ms, that's nothing. Wait until you see what he's done. I'm pretty easy. A couple of white claws. You know. white, I got I, white castles. You white mean. castles, <laughs> white claws. Yeah. That's, they made, uh, Andy, you got to tell the story, though. Um, the cover, the inside cover of uh, Go Go Crazy, inside the White Castles in the Bronx on Fordham Road, or uh, no, no, Post did, Road. No, we did that. That was oh, done Queens. in Queens on Roosevelt Avenue. Then fast forward to uh, Manitoba's Wild Kingdom. That was the best story ever. Yeah, the same guys in the picture going, hey, what are you guys? <laughs> they came back. <laughs> we came back, the same guys in the picture with them. The guy's the district manager now. The guy was in the first picture, looked at us, and they thought, what a bunch of assholes. Who are these fucking guys? And then, 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 years after, eight, right? then yeah, a decade later, well, more than that, we're in the White Castle, and the same guy is there. And the guy goes, you assholes again? <laughs> it goes to show you that working at White Castle might be better than college tuition, went, right? You went from working, managing the restaurant to managing the district. Hey, I, 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 He's probably making more money than Keith Roth and Eddie Trunk. <laughs> We're dummies in radio. I, the White Castle on Route 9 in Old Bridge, I swear to God. The, when I was talking to Jerry about when the King's X first came to, to New Jersey and we brought him here from Texas, I used, to go, I used to go to that White Castle for lunch and I would go in there and I'll never forget this late 87. There's a girl working behind the counter and she was being trained and she was like her first day, she was out of high school and she was like all nervous and she was messing up the order and, and everything. And, uh, you know, I, I, I felt bad for her. She's like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I was like, it's okay, it's okay. And then she finally gives me the order. I swear to God, I went there the other day on my way back from the shore. 
and the woman is still working there, and now she's just like, hey, but no, she's got a great, she's like running the place. And I'm like, I remember you on your training day. She's like, what? I was like, it's unbelievable. So maybe that is our calling, Keith. But they, uh, the world. Old for White Castle, right? Exactly. And it's a good thing we're on uh, cholesterol medication, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. We have to strike. Brighter future with White Castle. I'm loving it. I think we got the title for the new album. <laughs> um, so you guys want to do this or what? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. You talk to Pat, right? And, uh... Oh, you want to oh no, no. Pat's after you play. Uh, oh, see, yeah. yes, it says Eddie introduces the dictators, <laughs> and then it says dictators performance, <laughs> the big reveal of their new member. <laughs> You watch those commercials where you know they say you got to go to the bathroom four or five times a night. Can I hit the bathroom before we uh, play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so you guys go get ready, okay, and then uh, we're gonna bring you guys out to perform. Keith, yes, congratulations. Give it up for Keith. Who's running the dictators? And of course, Andy Albert lost the boss, so they're gonna go back there. And I guess uh, we probably have to. Pat, do we have to strike the table and stuff too, you think? We probably have to move this out if they're going to play, I would think, maybe? No? Can you see over it? We're going to pull it out? Okay, so we'll take a quick little pause here, and then I will be back to let these guys play. They're going to do a four-song set. First time Dictators with Keith Roth as their new singer, as we just announced. And then when they're done, Pat will come out, Pat Chesualdo from the Metal Hall of Fame. We'll come out, say a few words, and then that will roll into the actual inductions, which are coming your way with a video presentation, which will play shortly. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you both here live in Middletown, New Jersey, and also everybody watching on the stream. Give it up for their first performance ever. A lot of pressure on this man over there on the end. Uh, Keith Roth for the first time with the Dictators, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, we want to congratulate Mark Weiss on the honor of uh, being inducted to the Metal Hall of Fame, of course. Uh, Ross the Boss was in the initial uh, first... Uh, 2017. 2017. That's right. Albert's next year. <laughs> Me never. Keith, 10 years. Andy, Andy's always in my Hall of Fame, that's for sure. Oh, I gotta show the new boss, right? These guys are great. Okay, we're gonna do a song off the uh, Dictator's record, the FFD, who will say rock and roll.
Let's send their go to Keith, do a song off the album Blood Brothers. Love this song. Tell us the uh, story behind this one, Andy. The Minnesota Strip. Minnesota Strip. Uh, back in the 70s, they thought there was a, there was a lot of girls working on 8th Avenue, uh, young prostitutes, like teenage prostitutes, and they all seemed to come from the Midwest, in Minnesota. So they thought there was a pipeline from Minnesota to Port Authority Bus Terminal, 8th <laughs> Avenue, and they called it, uh, they used to call it the Minnesota Strip. So I thought that's a great song title. And, uh, let's go, give it a shot. Ross, ready? <laughs> Thank 
Okay, this is the uh, final tune. Um, yeah, I will start it off. It would be a pleasure, Andrew. <laughs>
guys. Thank you so much, Thank everybody. You. Let's hear it one more time for the Dick Changers, ladies and gentlemen. What do you think of the new guy? Was he all right? You should have seen the commotion he was making backstage and the demands and turning tables over and the beer wasn't cold enough. I mean, I think you just saw the final performance from Keith Roth and the Dick Changers, I gotta tell you. Uh, seriously though, great stuff. Congratulations, Keith, and great set from those guys. So we are just very, very, very close now to beginning the video presentation. <laughs> Give it up for JD, everybody. Are you kidding me? Yeah, of course, JD steps up. Look at him. <laughs> no idea, JD. JD from BLS, everybody. Come on. So, um, we are going to show the video presentation here in just a second of the actual awards as they do a quick reset back there backstage. JJ French just gave me an advance of his book, so that's what it looks like. And I look forward to reading it. And yeah, so I think we're gonna get Pat out here now any second. Is Pat standing by? There he is. So look, this is the guy that a number of years ago, I don't know how many years ago, yeah, uh, Pat is, uh, Five years ago, Pat reached out to me and said he wanted to do this, and, and we were talking, and he said he was doing it in L.A., and he said, I want you to come out and host these, and I said, all right, Pat, and I said, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, come, I, I'll come to L.A. I said, Pat, where, where do you live? And he goes, uh, I'm in Boonton. And I said, you're in Boonton? And I said, I'm in uh, Morris Plains. I said, well, we're five minutes away. So we met, and remember we had lunch, and we talked for a bit, and here he is five years in, a, a fellow Jersey guy, and he's, uh, at that time, it was called the Hall of Heavy Metal History. Yes, it was. And it's now evolved into the Metal Hall of Fame. Pat Jezewaldo, everybody, the man behind the whole thing. Hey, guys. Thank you, Andy, for always being here to be a part of it. You're right there from the very beginning. And what a great honor. And, and Eddie, I can't thank you enough. So thank you. Oh, thanks. It's, it's, a, thank you. It's, it's something that needs to be, you know, it's great to, that you give these artists uh, an opportunity to be acknowledged, both the bigger name people and then more of the behind the scenes people and the people in the industry. So I think that's really important. Uh, obviously, Pat, challenges because of COVID, like every other awards thing or TV thing or anything in the world of uh, just being out there and connecting with people, it's been been a challenge, but you figured out a way to do it like this, right? Yeah, you know, so just for the people that may not know, so every year we do the annual Metal Hall of Fame Gala uh, in California or in January, and uh, that's been going fantastic. In Anaheim, right before NAM. Right before NAM, yeah, we're the official unofficial kickoff of NAM, which is the, for people who may not know, the major uh, music instrument trade show. And, um, you know, now with COVID, we had to kind of restrict things, unfortunately, but since I'm here in Jersey too, I figured let's do a little something here. We had to do a live stream this year. Um, and, uh, you know, a live stream with the pre-recorded video, just because of, you know, COVID, we weren't able to do our gala. So I figured we'd do a little thing here. We were very restricted as to how many people we can have here, right? But then we have the uh, pre-recorded gala, which we had to do in video. So we got some great, you know, artists for this year, for the 2021 annual gala. We have, uh, of course, members of KISS and Iron Maiden and Mark, and, you know, so many wonderful people and uh, Triumph. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing the uh, show now. That's going to be a stream, live stream all over the world, the volume.com slash Metal Hall of Fame. And we can watch it here as well. Anybody that wants to watch it on the screen behind us and also online. So, and Pat, for people that can't watch it actually right now, uh, is it archived? Can they go online and see Absolutely. it later, at yep. a later date as well? Absolutely. Same yep. website? Same thing, yep. Volume.com slash Metal Hall of Fame. It'll be on then. And uh, and I thank all of you for coming out too. It's a little gathering. That's that's what it's all about. <laughs> thank you everybody. Keep it a real from Jersey, you know? And before we go, before we hit the stream, also, and, and we were talking, Pat and I were just I talking about this a little bit backstage. 
what are you, I, I know it's not decided yet because it still needs to be, we, we just don't know what the future holds on anything right now, but what are you hoping for, what are you thinking for the next one when we can actually do it the way we used to do it? We just had that conversation, but I was just going to say that. And again, as Eddie had mentioned, and as we all know, we have no idea where COVID's going to be, unfortunately. Hopefully it's going to be gone, right? But, <laughs> please. But um, we're thinking about what we're going to do for the gala next year. And we're thinking maybe possibly in East Coast. Very Woo! local. For the big, big show, we get 1,500, 2,000 people every year. And uh, we might do it here, we're, so we're, we're working on it. And it'd be nice to bring it back here. And of course, it's, it's, it's great to bring the Metal Hall of Fame to Jersey. And uh, I'm very grateful for all the fans everywhere, especially here in our home state. And, and, uh, and the one thing we do need to mention, of course, is the dad program real quick, because the Metal Hall of Fame is a nonprofit organization, and our parent company, or parent organization, is DAD, Drums and Disabilities. And I pioneered the healing art of drum therapy about 20 years ago or so, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg helped me launch a DAD program as a nonprofit organization, uh, where I use my drum therapy techniques to help special needs children, adults, and wounded veterans develop retention, coordination, fine motor skills, and physical and cognitive functioning. And, and I train psychologists, brain surgeons, occupational therapists, physical therapists, behavioral therapists, and uh, special ed teachers in the modalities of, of drum therapy. And, and we have the program in over 15 countries, and it's great to be helping the wounded troops and, and uh, all the people with special needs. So shout out to them as well. You know? so thank you all again so very much for coming. Um, I know it had to be a limited event right now, but, but I really deeply appreciate it from the bottom of my heart for everybody here and all our friends and family. And it is one big family, isn't it, Eddie? Yeah, it truly is. This, uh, you know, when this gets in your blood, it's in your blood, you know? It is, and, and nobody knows that more than you. <laughs> 38 years I've been doing this is pretty crazy, but it's always uh, great to be a part of events like this. It's awesome to be involved in things from the ground floor like I have been with this, and I appreciate you having me out at each and every one of them, and uh, we'll see what the future holds for the Metal Hall of Fame. As you can see on the table, metalhalloffame.org for more information about what Pat has going. And also, the, the stuff, you know, Pat, Pat's almost, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, downplaying the importance of the stuff that he does with the Drummers and Disabilities program. It's remarkable work and important work that he's doing. So, Thank one you. more round of applause for Pat. <laughs> so, this is your presentation. You want to you want to take it away and let everybody yeah. see this stream. All right. So here's our 2021 gala uh, for the Metal Hall of Fame. It's unfortunately streamed, but it's going to be on in about two minutes, right behind us. So if you want to hang out, here it is. So thank you all again, and uh, thanks for all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you very much. Hey, check it out, everybody. It's Phil from New York Rocks, and we're rocking down here in Middletown, New Jersey, for the fifth annual. Heavy Metal Awards, and we're here with Ross the Boss. The that man, would, the, that would be me. And you <laughs> were inducted today. No, 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 I was inducted. I was inducted okay. in 2017. Oh, all right. And the first class. There you go. See, you learn something new okay. every day. We're here to honor all the new inductees. Okay. Um, we're just uh, having a fantastic time. My, my, my first band, The Dictators, right. just played a little mini four, four set acoustic, and we, we debuted our new singer, Keith Roth. And uh, we're having a, you know, it's been great. First time we, for a, a day of first. First right. time for we played acoustic, and it's the first show with Keith Roth. So there was a lot on the line today. Yeah. There was no pressure here today, was there? Oh. No. <laughs> no, going out <laughs> of the internet. What could no. go wrong goes wrong, right? No, no, no pressure whatsoever, no. No, okay. but I think we did all right. I mean, I was pretty good on the acoustic guitar. I mean, I, I made a few, I fucked up a no, few no, things. but great. Yeah, yeah. No, so my mistakes sound good. They're always critical. They're always critical of themselves. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, right? I just made something up right on the spot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your past. When you first started out, you're from the Bronx, New York, so you're a local, and you started out in the punk like oh, rock dictators, thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you were in the scene band. with CBGB scene and right. around that right. low yeah. east side. Right. Yeah. yeah, we were we put out our first record. Well, we, we we were before CBGBs and Max's Kansas City put out our first record in 1975, The Dictators Go Curl Crazy, right. one year before the Ramones. And uh, 
you know, had that look, had the sound of punk, right. um, what would be American punk, proto-punk, um, kind of like, you know, a combination of metal and punk, mm -hmm. you know, because um, me, I was in the, I'm in the band, so yeah. I'm a heavy guitar player, and, uh, you know, so the band went on from there. We started playing CBGB's, CBGB's for real in around 77, and uh, we, came, we became one of the stalwarts of the, of the CBGB scene. And also, you're in uh, Man of War. Then I started Man of War. Uh, after after uh, three records with the Dictators, I had joined this French band called uh, Shaken Street. And then Shaken Street was on tour with Black Sabbath in England because we had the same managers and we were opening up for Sabbath. Um, I, there was a, Ronnie Dio comes up to me. You know, it was the Heaven and Hell tour. Ronnie comes up to me and goes, you know, I really love the way you play guitar. I love CB, I love New York Pump, I love the Dictators, I love you guys, but you know, I got this guy on my crew, his name's Joey DeMeo, and he plays bass, like you would never, like no one you've ever seen before, he said, you should go check him out, and I'm like, yes sir, yes sir, Mr. Dio, <laughs> so like, so I, I, I uh, sought Joey out, and we became friends, and we started to jam backstage on Black Sabbath, at, at the Black Sabbath shows, and then we decided that I was going to leave Shaken Street, named my replacement, Go off the road, write some songs. I called, I had a guy in uh, EMI, Bob Curry, head of EMI in New York. And we did, uh, we did a demo. I got a demo budget and he signed the band. Huh. Okay. And you had a couple story. of, you made a couple albums, so yeah, of course. I did six records with Man of War, the first six records in six years. It has never been matched. Now, Man of War is not in existence Man anymore? It was absolutely in existence. Okay. All right, so you're still with Man of War, but I now was, you I just... Was, I was out of Man of War yeah. in 88. Right, right. Before, right, right at Kings of Metal time. All right, right. right. But you, now you've uh, regrouped the Dictators now. Go ahead. The dictators have been playing Forever. since, but this, the real Dictators, I had the Dictators NYC, but now we have the real Dictators with our new drummer, Albert Bouchard, the right. original Blue Oyster Cult drummer. Yeah. This guy's a genius. Right. And we have our new member, Keith Roth. Uh, so, so, so we have the four of us. Great now. performance there today. Thank you, thank you. I enjoyed it immensely. As I, all playing very great. As I said, there's a lot of pressure. <laughs> very good guitar. Thank you. Very as good. I said, there's a lot of pressure today at the, on the Dictators. Yeah, yeah. And I think we, we made it. it. And I think we, we nailed, nailed it pretty good. Yeah. So uh, what, what can I say? It's an honor to be here at the, at the Hall of Fame induction. And uh, what can I say? I'm honored to be the, in the first class. So... So tell everybody how they can find out more about you and, you know, see what's going on with Ross, you right now. Yeah, RossTheBoss.com, Ross, Ross-TheBoss.com. Of course, uh, Facebook, Crackbook, I call it. Yeah. I, got all, I got all the usual uh, me, uh, biased media platforms. Yeah. And, um, How'd you get the nickname, Ross the Boss? Ross the Boss? <laughs> Actually, everyone asked me that. It was from playing baseball. Oh, yeah? yeah one day, I'm, we're playing, right? And uh, my friend goes, choose Ross, he's the boss. And I go... <laughs> oh, it must have been a while ago. Yeah, it was when I was a kid, you know. <laughs> right. But uh, so I, I kept it because uh, well, all the dictators we had nicknames because we were all Jew boys from the Bronx, oh, right. and we didn't want to be, you know, we, we, we wanted different names, right? Just because our names sucked, you know. We didn't want to be like the Kiss guys. Yeah, Ch Champ. the exact reason, you know. A lot, a lot, many Jewish actors and musicians changed their names. Stanley Iceland. Stanley Iceland. Yeah. Chaim Vitz. Chaim Vitz. Yeah. Right, right. There you go. But uh, you know, I'm Russ Friedman. Yeah. Not the, the greatest rock and roll name, Marty Friedman, yeah. but uh, he kept him. But uh, right. I'm proud, proud of my name, proud to be Jewish, Jewish American. And uh, we're here, we're playing. I got the Rust the Boss Band. I got Death Dealer, two metal pro my two metal bands, Big, and The Dictators now. And I couldn't, I couldn't be happier now. I really couldn't. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good Thank luck. you for congratulations. Yes. All right, check it out. This is Phil from New York Rocks. We're here at the Heavy Metal Awards, the fifth annual Heavy Metal Awards. And here with Albert. And Albert is the original drummer from Blue Oyster Cult. How you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm doing good. It's been a great day. Yeah. Lots of fun. You looked very happy today. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm delighted to play with these guys. And, and uh, you know, I love Keith Roth. You know, I mean, he might have mentioned, you know, how, you know, I, I was suggested that he join our band and and uh so i think it's going to be a great thing i have very good uh, feeling about this so he nailed it yeah yeah he totally did like i knew he would 
He I, remembered all the uh, the lyrics. I was like, wow, that was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, I I I played with you know I've sat in with Frankenstein 3000, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and we played a bunch of gigs together with my other band Blue Coop. So you're a professional musician. You've been yeah. playing for years. Yeah. It's like you know, right, right. Guys yeah. got it down pat. I think first I was on his radio show. Right. That's the first thing you know, the local radio show that he does down here, right? Right. That was many years ago, but so we've been friends for a long time and. And then when the dictators are looking for a singer, I'm like, hey, how about this guy, man? He's he, he's really sing, and he's got kind of a gruff voice, like you know, like Richard Manitoba, except he can really sing. Right. right. I mean, nothing against Richard. I love him. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he's he's never been anything but a great friend to me. Right. Right. Okay. So I I'm not, saying, but he's not a great singer. Come on. Even he. He had the bar, he right? The bar in the he's, city. Remember? He's he's. Did he have a bar in the city? He, right? Yes, yeah. he did. He had the bar. He's done a lot of things. He was yeah. on Sirius with with Keith, yeah. and. Uh, you know, uh, he's way funnier than Keith. <laughs> but sometimes, some not everybody appreciates his humor. Right. You know, I I do. But and then you, know. you got Ross the boss. Ross the boss, of course. I you know I was just saying that I've been playing with Ross for forty nine years, almost fifty years. We've been playing together. You know, I mean, not on stage usually. It's usually a studio thing. You know, or it comes over to my my crib and. Helps you with my demos and stuff like that. And so the, the gentleman was the bass player. What's oh, Andy Chernoff. Andy? Yeah, I know him just as long. I mean, and Andy and we've been collaborating for years. So you know, it's just a. It seemed like a natural thing to join the group. And uh, what was that recently? That yeah, did? yeah. Well, we started in 2019. He called me up and said, "Hey, I got a crazy idea. Yeah. Ross and Scott want to put the Dictators back together." Yeah. And uh, I said, I'd do it if you were the drummer. <laughs> I said, oh, the dick, I thought you were tired. He goes, yeah, well, you know, now I think, you know, now that we've, we've be t been in touch, you know, uh, and Scott really wants to do it. So it was really all about Scott at first. But then, you know, it took a while, the pandemic. And by the time he came back, like which was earlier this year, uh, he, he had a... Uh, deteriorating health condition right. and could not do it. He yeah. couldn't play anymore. Right. So I mean, it's a, it, it's a sad, but yeah. you know. But he would want us. You know, he wants us to to continue without him. Yeah. Right. He said, you know, you you guys got to play. It's great. You know, get out there great. and do it for the dictators. Yeah. yeah That's awesome. So. Now, when you started with um, Blue Ice the Cult, you're the original member, founding member yeah. of Drama. Yep. Yeah. I. How many albums you play with? <sighs> oh, I don't know. I played with it. Well, I it started in college. I was in college with this guy, Buck Dharma, you know, or Don Roser, and we had a college band. That, at first, we were absolutely terrible, yeah. and then the second year, we came back and we we actually started practicing, and we got really good, and we came, we became like the most popular band, you know, in the school during that that yeah. time period. We were working every what week. Year was that around? 1960, well, it was 1966, 66, 67 school year. That's so right. the doors are around. <laughs> right, right. Everybody. Well, I, I heard the doors when I came to New York, yeah. you know, in, in fall of 67. And I was like, eh, they're okay. Yeah. I kind of like the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> and the keyboard guy isn't bad either. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and the guitar player is pretty yeah. good. Oh, yeah, that, the singer is not bad either. So, yeah. Yeah, it took me a while to warm up to the doors, but you know, so we had a band in Stony Brook on Long Island, and uh, and we started playing gigs in the college there and getting you know getting some good gigs and getting and then we got a recording contract. Then of course we we fucked that all up. <laughs> we got kicked off the label. You know, it's like you know. Then we played some disastrous concerts made where albums with them. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and but uh, Blue Oyster Cult, I made. Uh, ah. ten, ten, uh, ten records while I w when I was in the group, and then another two records since I haven't been in the group. Wow. You know, I've co collaborated with him on studio albums, and do any live yeah, yeah. music too? Live well, albums? I play with him now and then. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, I'm not a yeah. part of the touring right. act or whatever, but if I come to a show or if they, if they, want, if they want to fly me out somewhere, yeah. which they've done, right. you know, they're a special show, yeah. 
you know, you know, featuring Albert Bouchard, former member. So, you know, I don't call myself. A, I'm a founding member. That's really what I am. So, Alex Bouchard, you're Albert. French. Albert. Albert. <laughs> That's okay. Albert Bouchard. My grandfather would be upset. Oh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get flack for that. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, you're French, right? That's uh, a French well, name. I think I th always thought I was French. I always thought I was French. But then I did the ancestry thing, yeah, yeah. and I'm 52% uh, Irish, 12% Irish, percent Scottish. Oh, okay. Do I look like a Scotsman? <laughs> you know, and and only five. And only 5% uh, French. I've okay. got some Spanish, some German, some Dutch. But yeah, mostly uh, mostly Irish and Scottish. Wow. Yeah. Okay. A little bit of English, too. All right. I want to tell everybody out there how they can find out more about you and what, what's going on with you right now. You can tell everybody how they can well, find out. I do have a website, albertbouchard.net. Albert. Yes, albertbouchard.net. And uh, there I talk about, you know, my gigs, although I forgot to put this one on there, I think. I don't know. I have the one on Tuesday. I also sing with the Glee Club, so I'm singing for the Mets, the national anthem on Tuesday. Then, yeah, yeah. And then on Saturday, I'm playing with Robert Gordon, the rockabilly, and his band. So, yeah, I, I got a lot of stuff Some serious going stuff going on. Yeah, I have my... my, uh, my Fifth solo album is coming out uh, in October, October 25th. Uh, on Can you sing on it too? Besides, yeah, uh, I I actually don't play drums on every song. I play drums on most of the songs, but uh, but I play guitar, like rhythm guitar, on all of them. And I, well, some of them I don't even sing on. That's right, because I have uh, the guys in Blue Oyster Cult are, are on it. Like Buck Dharma is doing a song that's. He's playing everything on it and singing all the vocals, except I play uh, piano and drums. Wow. What's up? But, multi talented. Yeah. Yeah, multi talented. That's, that's my solo record. I Albert. Said, yes. That's it. Yes. So, gotta make sure. AlbertBouchard.net, and you'll find out about all my adventures. Uh, my space rock record, and, you know, with the Hawkwing guys. and. Oh, yeah. You're going to be like, you were standing next to a legend in rock and roll. Don't you realize? I, I, you're very humble. I like you're very to stay busy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you look yeah. happy. Thank and you. Yeah. Congratulations oh, being here today. Thank you. Thank you for the interview. Okay. All right, man. Okay, you rock. Man. Thank Albert, you. man. Albert okay. Bouchard. Hey, check it out, everybody. Phil from New York Rocks. We're here at the Metal Awards, the fifth annual. And we're here with Jerry Gaskill. There you go. We got it right. There you go. He's from King's X, right? And then you're the drummer. I'm the drummer. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. See, I know something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, now what brings you down here today? And let's talk a little bit about the music here. Well, Mark Weiss asked me to come down. Right. And I did an interview with uh, Eddie Trunk and Keith Roth. You know, Mark has his display of all of his photography, and uh, that's why I'm here. Always, always ready to support Mark. Yeah. Now, you talked a little bit about you had a couple of issues going on. You had medical issues, but you've been addressing that all. And, you know, you had an awakening about that. Talk a little about that. Well, uh, yeah, well, I've had a couple heart attacks. The first one killed me, literally died. And, uh, and I'm doing great now. And I, it, it taught me to, to listen to my body. Like I said earlier, it was the, I think the best thing that ever happened to me. Because now I know to listen to my body. And if we want to stay in this world, it's our bodies that keep us here. So you say you got to check the oil every now and then. You do, now. yeah. When you got to do older, it. You know, you got to find right. out what's going on inside yeah. you. Right? You got to do it. You got to check you know? check with your doctor. Hey, we lived through the '80s, you know. We rocked it out. Yeah, you know? we're still here. Yeah, well, yeah. But you never know. Anything can happen at any moment. That's right. That's right. We got to be gra We have to be grateful for what we have. You yep. know, yep. that yep. we're we're still uh, we're still around. Yep. Okay, now let's talk about the music now. You were with uh, King's X for how long? When did you start out with King's X? That was that your first band? You know, you probably oh, had. I've been playing uh, basically my whole life, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we all met in uh, Springfield, Missouri in 19. I think I met Doug in 79, very end of 79, and Doug and Ty in 1980. And we formed a band in 1980, and we've been together ever since. Now, Doug is what? He's the bass player, lead singer, yeah. Okay. All right. And you formed King's X, and how many albums did you make with King's X now? 
I think we have around 15 now. Wow. And we've got a new one we just finished. It's going to be out pretty soon. Cool. Yeah. What's the name of it? Do you have a title yet? Well, we do, but it's not to be announced. It? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Because it hasn't been released yet either. It's not been released, no. So. Okay. Are you going to tour? When's the tour? Are you going to tour? Start touring it? Well, we will tour when the world allows us to tour. Right, yes. Right. Yeah, yes. everything's so up in the air still, you know, and especially in this area. How do you feel about that, what's going on, you know, with the music right now? Everything pretty much is like, you know, it's a go or it's not a go. What is that? It, it's, you know? it's, it's just a crazy world we live in right now. You know, the pandemic changed everything. Like 2020, we had the whole year planned. We we're going to go to Europe, going to play uh, cities we hadn't played in a while it's going to be great yeah. and you know the pandemic Stop. wiped yeah. it right out and it's still happening yeah. I don't know when it's going to change yeah. you, know? you got to take it one day at a time man that's how life is like right now be, you know. it always is that way just now we have this pandemic on top of Jerry, it tell everybody how they can find out what's going on and you know with the new album and everything that's going to come out and how they can find out when it does come out well you can just Go online, type in King's X, right. and you'll find anything you need to know. There you go. Cause Social the new media. album's going to come out soon? It'll be out somewhat soon, yeah. There soon. you go. Yeah. All right, you heard it right here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Check it Ciao. out. Phil from New York Rocks rocking down here at the Metal Awards. Yeah. Metal. We are metal. Totally, man. Who's more metal than this guy right yeah. here? Not there you go. I don't know. I'm, I'm half metal. <laughs> I got metal in my leg, in my pelvis, in my prostate, you know. It's all right. AD from Black Label Society, man. There you What's go, man. Here we are at the Medal Awards honoring Mark. It was amazing, yeah, yeah. and a lot of other great people, man. Yeah, so, yeah. really cool to see. I didn't. I wasn't even aware of this. Yeah, yeah. That we even had a Medal Award, right, which right. is dope, man. Yeah. You know, that's really cool. <laughs> so, right you know, on, it's man. the fifth annual, actually. I know, man. Years. I don't know where I was. Going on. I so nobody told me. What the fuck? They don't want me around. And you live in Jersey they too, I think. Right? Yeah, that's why they didn't oh, want me to come on, down. Man. You're the greatest. You're yeah. funny. You know, you gotta. You play bass in a great that, band. That's probably you know? why. I play bass. Nobody wants to hear about the bass player. The Nobody bass cares player. about the bass player. Right here. I love you. I'm giving you love right here, man. That's true. There you go. Thank you. I Thank actually you. interviewed you a while ago. I don't yeah. remember. It was like a little bar down in the, uh, it was like a High Times Magazine. was doing a party. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yes. I wish I could find it. I got, so much, awesome. I got so much that was footage. a long time ago, man. It was like yeah. 12 years ago. Yeah, a, yeah, a long, yeah. long time ago, man. <laughs> I, I was taller then. You remember, you remember, you yeah. remember though. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, good. You. And I remember you too, yeah, man. Yeah. 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 You How you been? Party. You been all right? I've been straight too. I'm like, oh my god, I'm a, really? I'm at a party. Everybody, we're all like in a High Times wasted. magazine. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, there I am, the, yeah, the only guy that ain't smoking weed. I yeah, think right. at the party. That's yeah. right. I smoked enough for you. It was all right. Man. <laughs> hey, back in the day, you know, everybody, they, you know, said they didn't inhale. Day. They did. Every day, man. <laughs> every day, you know, that's all. But it's good. Okay. Let's talk about the music and what's going on with you and the band and tell everybody. Uh, we're going on tour um, in two weeks. Uh, we, uh, we rehearse in L.A. and then um, we have October and November booked. Is that so, the first time you're going on tour now on since tour? the pandemic? Yeah, man. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. We, we did two shows, one in Sturgis, one in Montana, and then we did a show in Virginia the other day. And that was the first shows that we did in a year and a half, man. Yeah, yeah. So it was great, man, you know. It, it, it was fucking cool, you know. It was it, good to be back on the stage yeah, in front yeah. of people, yeah, feeling cool. good, right? Like I said, you know what? I mean, I love home, too, because yeah, home was yeah, great, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved it, you know, it's, but whatever. Yeah. You know, it's like fucking, we got to get out there and get yeah, back to work, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. you know. So, yeah. so it's good, and the fans are great, man. They yeah. can't wait, you know. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't wait. It was just like, you know, like when, uh, when sports came back, you know, right, it was right. like, oh, shit, thank God, you know. Yeah. So now when the music comes back, it, it'll be probably like a similar thing. Yeah, so people are psyched. They're all going out, you know. So how does Zach feel about all that that's going on and everything? Everybody all right in good spirits? Yeah, yeah, we're all good, man. Yeah, yeah. But it's just unfortunate, you know. Yeah. And a lot of the clubs will have, you know, protocols and shit yeah, now yeah, that, yeah. that we don't have nothing to do with. Right. So whatever the fuck, you know, you yeah. got to do. You got to do what you got to do, to yeah. man. It's yeah. unfortunate to everything, man, you know. You don't want it, nobody to get sick, you know. Yeah. But you yeah. know. But at the same time, you, you want to live your life, man. Right. So yeah. you got to do it, man, you know. You got to take care of your health. Yeah, it's, just be, be careful important. if you can, you know. And if you feel vulnerable, then, yeah. then maybe you shouldn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? But whatever, man. Yeah. For the most part, we're, we're forging ahead, man, you know. <laughs> 
so. <laughs> no, we're going to rock and roll all night and party <laughs> each and every other day every or every something day. like that, right? Well, well, now it's every other day because I'm older, you know. <laughs> every other day now, you know. But, yeah. Okay, let's talk about new music. Do you have new music on the horizon? Talk about that. Well, Black Label has the new record coming out. You know, we have two singles. Well, one single's out already. Another one's coming out, I think, uh, next week. And then uh, the record will come out in November. And that's uh, Doom Crew, Inc. Right. And that's the new Black Label. And that'll... Uh, it's not very good. Jerry said it wasn't very yeah, good. No, that's Jerry Gasco from King's X. And he knows good music. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's hard. It's awesome. So it's 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 killer, yeah, yeah, yeah. dude. And uh, this, the video's out now. It's it's silly, it's stupid. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, it's a song called "Set You Free," and we had a lot of fun making it. The next one's uh, wait. Well, I'm not saying anything, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you guys will just wait for them. And uh, you know, right, yeah, yeah. the stupidity never ends though yeah. with Black Label. It's pretty awesome. I see you guys playing. You played at Starland. I was at that show. It was great. Yeah, it was a while ago, right? It was like, yeah, it was like a year yeah. ago. Well, everything was a while ago now. Yeah. It's like, fuck. That's right. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Well, I live right next to Star. Well, not next to it, but it's 15 minutes away from it. We'll tell them your address. They'll have them all at your house. You know, they'll be bothering you. Well, they can pay the bills if they want. That's, that's cool. You know what I'm saying? But uh, no, besides that, you know, everything's good. Um, yeah, man, I can't wait to get back out there and rock out. And it's Star. Well, we're not playing Starland this time. We're playing the Wellmont. In uh, Montclair. Yeah, Montclair. Yep. So I don't know if you guys will be there, you know, but uh, so I think it's in November, you know yeah. what I mean? So I'm um, looking forward to that one. That's another home show for me, Great. you know, so I get to drive to work that day. <laughs> it's pretty cool, you know. And then uh, that's you it. Man. You have a bike? You take your bike? You no, ride a bike? I, no. no. I, I can't be trusted on a bike, man. <laughs> nah. I got a big yeah. truck, man. Big truck. Put me in like a tank, you know what that's I mean? Good. Cool. Yeah, be safe, you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but yeah. but it's all good. You have a family, kids and everything. No kids, man, but uh, you know, yeah. my girl, we dog and cat, <laughs> you know, fucking you know. You bills, go. responsibilities. That's right. But man. That's it, man, you know, life's good. All right, I wanna thank you very much for the interview here today oh, and you guys rock, man. Hey. Say hello to Zach and the boys. Hello, man. And, uh, yeah, who rocks better than us, man? Come on, nobody. It, we rock the best. Right on. That's that's about the ego, you know. <laughs> you good, bro. Keep it metal. Nice seeing you, man. Uh, rock on, man. All right, check it out. This is Phil from New York Rocks. We're at the Heavy Metal Awards here in Middletown, New Jersey. It's the fifth annual one, and we're here with Mike Orlando. Mike, how you doing? How you doing, man? It's good to see you here. Great. Yeah, it's great event. to see you, man. You know. Ah, thank you, man. Yeah, it's I, good to be I out know a little you bit. You got a long history in the music. Let's talk about how you started in the music and a little bit about where you're from. And oh, I mean, well, originally from Staten Island, New York. Oh, there you go. Born and raised. Yeah. Um, still there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just started real young, man. Playing guitar since I'm um, single digits okay. <laughs> yeah. who was your inspiration to become play the guitar my father had me listening to les paul that was what really got me into it you know starting guitar and then of course the rock guys came along you know you so. ever get to meet les paul he used to be in uh the iridium, the iridium. yeah i did i got to take my father and my my mom and dad we took him to see uh to les in uh the iridium of maybe 90 for, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Right before he yeah. passed away. Yeah, I didn't get to see him, and then he passed away. I was like, oh, he oh, passed away. Amazing. I met his brother, Rusty. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. He passed away yeah. too. He would always be there working, or right. they had they had some family members at Great the guy. Iridium. Great yeah. People, yeah. Man. It was awesome. With the Gibson people. I know a lot of people with Gibson guitars. Hell yeah. And uh, let's talk about the music now. You played in which bands, like starting out a little bit, and then you got into what? Adrenaline Mob? Yeah, well, Adrenaline Mob started by, back in 2010. So right. that was uh, the, the newest, you know, formation. But I mean, I've been doing bands for for ages, you know, as we all have, you know. Um, but Adrenaline Mob was, was the first, you know, big band that we got to tour worldwide, you know, for years. and enjoyed a lot of great uh, success with that we had a lot of downfalls and, well, and had uh, you tragedy yeah, yeah. kind of like a little bit hard it's like still a little fresh yeah you know? yeah and I know yeah. David you know, and yeah evil Jane right? yeah 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 Jane and, and Dave yeah. unfortunately beautiful people yeah. that we lost in the uh, in the tragic uh, adrenaline yeah. mob uh, crash and uh, the tour before that we lost one of the sweetest guys AJ Pirro 
you know. So we've had, you know, extreme lows, but, you know, ex a lot of extreme highs, and, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I hate, you know, I don't like really bring it up and everything, but you've come so far, and he's such an excellent guitarist, this guy, that's a nice guy. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> really it. Really great person. S still out there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Always working in the studio because I own a recording studio, so right. I'm always behind the console. But uh, we have a lot of new yeah, right. new stuff coming out for next year right. that we've been working the on. Um, no, I have a new band called right. Dance of the Damned, and it's with uh, Andrew Freeman on vocals, uh, amazing singer from the band Last in Line which is Vinnie Apice and, and Vivian Campbell's band. Um, so Andrew is incredible. And Achilles Priester on drums, who is uh, from Angra and so many other incredible bands. So one of the greatest drummers. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to, you know, exactly when they're going to come out. But I also have a, a completely different sounding lineup with uh, Corey Glover of Living Color, who for me is one of the greatest singers ever. <laughs> Period. Uh, he's a he's a he's East an Coast guy, player. yeah. But Probably you know, player. working with Corey is uh, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. His voice is it's just out of this world. So you know, I cannot wait for that to come out. It's yeah. one of one of the one you of the favorite the things I've I've ever done musically is with uh, Corey. Yeah. So yeah, it's me and Corey. We have an incredible band that will be announcing soon, and uh, and my band Noturnal, right. based in yeah. Brazil. And Jerry Gaskell's making fun. Now he has to come and say hi because he's bombing up. <laughs> Which I love Jerry Gaskell. He has to poke in and just say hi. I love this guy. What's the story, Jerry? Remember that? I already told the story. That's the story. <laughs> I, I love this guy. That was a commercial a long time ago. That's the story, Jerry. Yeah. So right. those two bands and my band, Noternal, right. who is based in Brazil. We have a new album coming out. So... There's lots coming, a lot of music. That's your solo, right? um, no, that's Sonic Stomp. So um, these are three, you know, full-on bands. So that'll all be out next year. Okay. Yeah. Now tell everybody how they can find out exactly how you know, because they can find out on the internet and yeah, you know, just, log in. I'm I'm on all the socials, Michael Orlando Music on yeah. every social media platform. That's all you got to type in. So, yeah. Michael Orlando Music. Well, it's always a pleasure talking to you and you. meeting you. I mean, I met you. <laughs> we're actually it was in the doctor's office. I seen you, and you yeah, were coming right. out. You were a cane. You have been through a lot yeah, in the last yeah. four years. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. thank you very much, and best of luck to you. Thank man. you very I hope much. Hope to see you soon, thank man. You. And see yeah. you playing on the stage Next soon. Next year, right. definitely. Twenty twenty. All right, Johannes. Yeah. How you doing today? Oh, pretty cool. It's a great crowd, and it's just a lot of fun doing this. Yeah, yeah. You know, I really enjoy let's it. talk about all the artwork that you have here and how you got started. Tell everybody a little bit where you're from with that name. Uh, I, I, oh. well, I, I, you know, Greek born, uh, emigrated when I was a kid in the United States. Yeah. I uh, started doing artwork uh, in the late 70s when I was still a teen. And uh, 300 record covers later, here we are, you know? <laughs> you were doodling in school? Yeah, that kind of a, yeah, yeah that, that, that's it pretty much, right? And then it just, uh, you know, the only, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, the, unlike other Greeks, I'm the only guy who didn't open up a restaurant, you know, decided to go in the music industry, right, for a living. A diner in New York, the diners. Yeah, there you go, man, the great Jersey, di the great Jersey diners, you know? Okay, now... When you came out to America, you were how old? You were young. Well, I, well it, it happened twice actually. I came when I was eight, uh, nine years old, right. but then my parents sent me back uh, in the uh, early '70s, uh, thinking they were going to return. So I went to school there for a couple of years, and that's when I discovered hard rock, and uh, I got into that. And then, you know, when I returned, obviously we stayed. I went to school here, and you know, the rest is history. So right. that's how Had that you went get your down. Big break. Had you get your uh, I, Really, well, not much. I mean, it was just a series of events that occurred. Uh, I mean, I just started, you know, when I was going to school and I was working at my uncle's restaurant on the weekends. You know, it was a huge thriving club scene. And one night, one of the club owners uh, came to get some ice because they run out of ice. And uh, he said, oh, you know, Yaga tells me you're a good artist. And uh, would you do a, a poster for me for one of my bands that's playing next week? And I thought that was a cool idea. And I did that. And made my first 20 bucks and by that summer I was doing artwork for every club in in Connecticut Yale New Haven so and it, yeah and that's how it started and uh, 1980 uh, Chris Squire of Yes hired me to do artwork for 
one of his projects that he was producing, and I started doing covers on CBS, and I worked at Lieber and Krebs. That's where I met uh, Mark Weiss later. And, uh, you know, I, and it just kind of built from here. So it was just a matter of, it was just a series of stuff that just kind of led to all this, you know. But in the end, it was always uh, about me just... Uh, just doing the work that I loved, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, just music and I love comic book art, and, and it just it was a perfect combination. You know, record covers was the answer back then. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's talk about some of the artwork that you have here behind us, and talk about some of your favorites, and you know, talk uh, about some of that stuff. I'm always like probably just looking like for the next thing that I'm going to do, but a variety of styles. I mean, there's Artwork that I've done for Quiet Riot, this Fate's Warning, this Deep Purple, because I do both digital and paintings. There's a Black Hole Heaven, that stuff was Zeppelin. Um, I worked, I did extreme porn graffiti. I worked with Dokken, Slaughter, Ingrid Malstein, Johnny Winter, uh, King Crimson, Uriah Heep. I did Bon Jovi's World Tour. I did a work for the Stones. Um, it's, where it's, a lot of it's, this, uh, where's it appearing? Is it appearing like on album covers or inserts? I mean, uh, well, usually, I, I mean, the artwork is paintings that I always wanted to do, right? Um, I, I think that I do. So usually, you know, the band will approach me. They will have a discussion. They'll tell me about what they're thinking. I, I create the actual painting, the actual artwork, and that becomes a record cover. Their stage designs, their graphics, their merchandising, and so on. The originals I own and I keep. Yeah. Uh, the artwork uh, then is used in all sorts of ways, you know, uh, you know, depends on the, the situation. I mean, in the situation of Bon Jovi, he asked me for a specific piece of art he wanted that became the whole look for the 1995 World Tour. Uh, for Deep Purple, it was for their album, uh, Abandon, and there was a concept they wanted, and so I, dis I did the original idea, and that was transformed later into stage designs and tour programs and, you know, the whole gamut. Yeah. Mind. That's so blows me away. It's the whole many years, many years of of work. Man, Thirty eight years, right? I mean, what are you doing now? Let's say. Uh, well, I, I, there's a number of projects. Uh, after the success of the Led Zeppelin book that I did uh, with uh, the author Denny Somak, I'm working on a Beatles project. Um, me and Mark are going to take this on the road, so it'll be a, a joint exhibition of his photography and my paintings. Right. Um, and we're going to be able to talk about our work, uh, antidotes about the stories with the rock stars and how we met and how we did artwork together. And you know, it should be a fun time. Uh, I'm also working on a number of album covers, which I'm not at liberty to say who it is right now. But um, and there's also um, uh, the, a lot of my artwork is going to be coming out in uh, as T-shirts and posters soon. So that'll be kind of a lot of fun. But it's still. It's just still the same thing, man. I just get up in the morning and uh, I just listen to a piece of music and I draw to it. And there you go. And that's all it is, man. <laughs> you know, that's all it really is. <laughs> nothing, nothing fancy, you know. I'm just, uh, I'm just lucky that I don't have to pump gas for a living, and that's what you know I was able to, you know, do to be able to to live. You know, it was a cool thing. It's a dream. The dream came true. It took right. take a long time. Persistence and uh, just just doing it. You know, yeah. just just doing it. That's all you got. That's all you got to do. But, but this is a really great event. It's just yeah. a lot of fun being here right now. Yeah. Just just really a great event. You know, I'm part to be part and support uh, the Metal Hall of Fame and support Pat. He's a really great guy and a great cause. So why not? Why not? Well, I appreciate it, man. This is really Thank cool. Thank you very much for the interview. Hey, it was a Best great mission. It seems luck like you make your own man. luck, right? So, hey, it's all yeah. you could do. It's all you could do, man. All right, very tell cool. everybody how they can find out about uh, your art. Dangerous age, DangerousAge.com is my website. And from there, there's links to Facebook pages and Twitter and Instagram. And there's also YouTube find videos and all kinds of stuff that I've done. You have to spell it out, I think, for everybody. Okay, yeah, Dangerous active. Age, like the word danger. Yeah, yeah. So it's DangerousAge.com, www.DangerousAge.com. There you go. And Easy. there you go, man. And you'll see it all there. All right. All right, man. cool. Thank Good luck. Thank you very much. You rock, buddy. Shit. Take Just care, finished man. up the whole day. It was the medal awards. Yeah. And I'm standing in no other than Mark Weiss, the, one of the greatest rock photographers. Because... Well, the greatest for me.
Thank you know, you. my era, from the 80s and a decade that rocked, right? Yeah, right. yeah. And last time I saw you was probably a good seven, eight years ago. Right. You were at another uh, gallery exhibition. That's right. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're still doing it. That's, that's it. Persistence in rock and roll. That's it. You stick right. to it and you right. have fun. And that's what I did all these years. And I'm showing it off here. And going to look for another town after this one. It's sad to see this one go because, you know, it takes so much time and energy to get it just right. Yeah. And you got to take it down and then you find a new home for it. And then there's new, new walls. So uh, looking forward to the next one. You took so many iconic pictures and actually the one is right here behind us of Freddie Mercury. Right? Yep, yep. That, that was the garden 1980. There you go. Yep. I've been shooting them at the garden since 1978 and every, you know, up until the mid 80s or late 80s. Now, when they spoke before, somebody had mentioned, man, oh, they see you a long time ago, get into, the, like, the garden, and, you know, he'd be up there taking the pictures, and that was, what was the, what was that time period when you first started? Uh, 1977, I started sneaking in my camera, 76, actually, and uh, I uh, just was having fun. I would sneak in the first night for, you know, I used to sneak in, give the, give the guard a couple dollars, and I, I dismantle my cameras, put them under my clothes, and I get in and I put them together, and then I get real close and stay up all night, develop them in the dark room, and sell them at the next concert or at the high school. And then I got arrested at a Kiss concert, oh, 1977, and, and then I went to Circus Magazine, and they liked my material, and I, they gave me a couple of hints to do this, use this film, and the first picture was a centerfold of Steven Tyler. So that's how the ball started rolling. And then you had a relationship you got going with Ozzy. You were with Ozzy for a while. Yeah, well, one of my assignments with Circus was uh, the cover of uh, Circus Magazine. Right. And it was Ozzy. And uh, I put him in a, tink, a pink tutu because it was most athletic. Was the, the bunny rabbit. That was another shoot. Oh, and the bunny rabbit, the, the shaved head, you know. So, uh, you know, once the pink tutu came out, he started let we just had fun, you know. Uh, but yeah, that was all good. And Ozzy kind of, you know, that whole, they took me under their belt. And I still, to this day, you know, we're in touch and still shooting and whatnot. So you have all these photographs all over. And then you're going to do something with the photographs again with the, with the painting. As your photograph is going to turn into like artwork, you're going well, to do that again. Right? Well, yeah, those are silk screens. Uh, yeah. I was working back then when I first met you with David Banigas, but right. now I have a silk screen artist named Steve Lacey, and the uh, ones that were in the hallway. Right. And he takes my photos, he manipulates them a little bit in Photoshop, and then we, we call it mixed media. Mm -hmm. And then he, he makes these huge uh, original silk screens. Right. And that's a process. It takes yeah. him weeks, but he loves doing it. Right. And we're, you know, we're selling them and uh it's displaying them just like this so it's another you know it's just something a little different and, right. and i'm glad to have a partner like that now you were a part of a different realm when you used to do photography it was all, it wasn't digital it was all you know you had to know how to use the camera correctly that must have took a long time to acquire all that you know taking pictures especially at concerts with lighting and stuff because every time i tried to take a picture i was not in front yeah. but i would be in the back and be like oh the lighting is so bright it's like that's yeah talk about I, that it was all nerve-wracking yeah. back then because yeah you, you gotta sneak the camera in first and yeah, yeah, take yeah. get the pictures because i didn't have a photo pass at right. the time and then you have to you know make sure you you get them you know, because I used to develop my own black and white, so you got to put it in the canister, and you got to make sure you get it just right, or it gets messed up. Right. So it's a little nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now it's just like you know, click, you see it, and you got it. Yeah, so, you know, you didn't know back then; you yeah. just had to do it. Right. You know, just like back in the. Uh, and the you film, know, you had to buy the film. Now you can yeah. buy the SD cards and everything. It, so they made it a lot, e a lot easier, easier and a lot, yeah. a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more opportunities for people that would not normally have it because. They didn't have money or right. for to buy film because it was expensive. I used to mow right. lawns yeah. to do it, but yeah. you know, I really wanted to do it. It was a passion, and I loved music. It was the right time, and I loved meeting new people, and, and that's how I, I created these images. Mm -hmm. Now, you did a lot of work with Twisted Sister. You did a lot of the album covers. You did Stay Hungry and a couple other ones. Talk yeah, about some of the come out and play. Yeah, that was my first album cover, Stay Hungry. They kind of gave me the chance. They saw my photos on cover a lot of the rock magazines and they thought you know it'd be cool to have a, a rock photographer instead of just some corporate guy that the record company hired 
So they took a chance on me and I created this set, uh, both sets. The Stay Hungry was a built set in my studio where we had, I bought the, the prop mice and got the bone and the whole deal. And then to come out and play, we built that street and created that whole imagery. And that was, you know, it's like another challenge. And, and album covers are, are great because they just last forever. Magazine covers are like, you know, once a month they come out, then they go, they're away. Album covers are still there. So now the albums are like, you know, I'm listening to the radio on Sirius and I'll see a cover of uh, Cinderella Night Songs. And then, you know, I'm listening to Hair Nation. I'll see, um, uh, you know, Slippery When Wet cover. And then, uh, you know, Dock and Under Lock and Key. So you know, I switch, switch the channel to, uh, what is it? Uh, Ozzy's Boneyard. And then there's Suicidal Tendencies album cover, you know? and then anthrax you know so it's nice seeing the, right. these nice little yeah. big albums little but they're kind of cool you're driving around you're listening right. to the music it'll be around forever exactly for yeah so that's that, that that's was great. my goal but yeah God. now you came out with the book right you have the book got katie that rock talk a little about that guys well it's just like i've been wanting to put a collection out of my work but i just i knew it was going to be a lot of work yeah. I, I wasn't ready uh, five years ago, or seven years ago, I this eight years ago, believe it or not, I decided to you know commit to it. Signed a, a deal with Inside Editions, and uh, we just started getting the ball rolling. It was going to be a different book. It was going to uh, less complicated, like more of a, just a pinup book. And then I decided after two years, I wanted it to be more of a, uh, really about me and about a narrative of my life and important shoots that I that I did. So I just like coffee table picture book, you know, a bit more. Oh. Yeah. So I, year after year for five years, I spent time on just creating these, you know, chapters each year. I did it. I figured that's the only way I'm going to be able to do it is in chapters. I was going to do it in bands and then, but I just wanted to do it in chapters, you know, segue it into the next. And it ended up being 600 pages, and then we had to whittle it down to 400. It's only supposed to be 230, so, you know, it's a 378-page book with three gatefolds, and, uh, you know, it's a hardcover. It's six pounds, one ounce, you know, and uh, it's just I'm really proud of it. It's, like, perfect, you know, so I'll be doing other books as well. I want to do a book on just 1980 and, and be able to put all the bands in there that I left out, you know, 1981, you know. Do, so there's ten books in the making I, I plan to do. Well, you had a great career of, and body of work from even Guns N' Roses when they first started. they have seen it, they were a picture at CBGB's, and it's like, man, and they've, uh, the backstage photo of Eddie Van Halen, shooting Van Halen, I mean, yeah. you've been there. You know? fun, fun, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I know you work doing some work with the acquiring, you know, and now, you know, the, with the pandemic, we don't, we got to see what's going to happen with that, too, you know? Yep, yep, yeah. so, yeah. I would say just uh, you know stay tuned. Go check out my website, uh, thedecadethatrock.com. I have personalized copies. You can get it on Amazon too. And uh, just uh, uh, keep keep rocking. He's the kind of guy when you see him, they're like, "How's that guy getting over there? He gets into the pit area. How do he get over there?" Because he kept with it. He kept doing it. Yeah. And then you gotta have the passion. You gotta have the drive. You know. Yeah. Well, thank you very okay. much. And, you know, congratulations, too. To, to right. You got inducted into the Metal Hall of Fame. That's yes. what we're here. Yeah, yeah. Very excited about that. And it's a really great honor to have Dee Snyder, who yeah. I did the first album cover, to induct me. So that yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully they'll have it here. They'll have the awards here, because that's what he said. Maybe they're going to oh, bring wow. the awards yeah, to over here in the cool. East Coast area. Yeah, all right. The East Coast rocker, remember? East Coast rocker. Yeah. There you go, man. That's you, East Coast Rocker. Thanks, man. All right, Thanks man. For having Thank me. you very much. All right, peace out, everybody.